the time of I think this time our participants are all Hebrew speakers. I don't know, but we do have people who listen in afterwards. Okay, you're dead. We can start the thing. So great to have you here with us. Uh, we are hosting from the Gershon Fintech Center at the Hebrew University Business School, uh, having you uh, here the fifth uh, lecture and the last one of this mini course. Uh, amazingly interesting and uh, we're going to have the summary today and many much more uh, interesting things that you brought to us so please do you want to advertise the other mini course that just went live um yes we're going to have another mini course starting this coming wednesday about uh, how to raise uh, funds in 2022 which is uh, different than it used to be, but still uh, interesting to learn. Mm. That's not me. That's another lecture. No, no, it a sounds interesting. Lecture. Where, yes, we have uh, the information in our website at the Gershon Fintech Center. I'll send the link uh, in the chat. Thank you. Okay. Everybody. So thank you for those of you who have lasted and are still with me on our fifth and final lecture. You'll remember we were only going to have four and we added one. Um, we have quite a big agenda today. So I'm gonna not go into great detail. This is kind of like a catch-all for a number of other topics that I wanted to address. Uh, I have to say for me, it's been really interesting because it gave me an opportunity to research and learn some things that um, I haven't really researched um, in a while, so it helped me come up to date as well. Does everyone see the screen? Yes. Okay. Yes, but not full screen. Yeah, now it is full screen. It's full screen. Yes. So we tried to make sure we don't repeat mistakes of the past, and now we can dive right in without technical problems. Let's keep our fingers crossed that that can continue. So as you know, the lecture series is called the Paytech Frontier. We're on the fifth lecture of five. Let's review quickly what we've done. So we started out talking about the business case for payments, trends, players, where disruption is coming from and how companies are trying to retain their customers and their current business. Then we went into a lecture. We thought it would be one lecture on payment cards. It ended up being two. So lecture two was about the acquiring side of, um, of payment cards, which are credit cards, debit cards, prepaid cards. And then lecture three, we went to the issuing side of payment cards and we talked about account to account payments, uh, which are mostly faster payments or instant payments, also known as immediate payments or real time, real time payments. And said a few words about ACH transfers and checks since we're going to be talking about B2B payments, I'll be saying a little bit more about checks because that is a big part of how businesses pay each other in many countries. And then the fourth lecture, the plan was to talk about um, three forms of digital currencies. So central bank digital currencies, stable coins, and programmatic cryptocurrencies such as Bitcoin, and also to touch on non-fungible tokens. Central bank digital currencies was the last part of that lecture. And I didn't get to it, so that will be the first part of the lecture today. I'll try to be brief to make sure we finish everything in an hour and a half. And then I'll be talking about cross-border payments, um, including FX, foreign currency conversions. Um, we'll move on to business-to-business -business payments or B2B. And um, then we will, I'll say a few words about regulation and then we'll conclude. So hopefully we can do all of that in 90 minutes. So the last part of the prior lecture, which was about uh, digital currencies, is um, about central bank digital currencies, also known as CBDCs. So what are CBDCs? These are um, currencies, or it is a currency that is issued by the central bank which makes it fiat money, F-I-A-T, for those who don't know the term. Fiat money is kind of money issued by the sovereign power. 
It's not a digital currency issued by a private entity or by an algorithm. So it could be you know, a euro or a shekel or a dollar, a US dollar. Um, however, um, when it comes to central bank digital currencies, well, well, let me just complete the point about fiat money. So what is fiat money? It provides a legal claim against the central bank. So if you hold a dollar bill or you hold any kind of banknote, it actually is a legal claim uh, for value equal to the amount on that note. Um, and, and central banks around the world have been looking at the question of, should we think about issuing our money, our fiat currency in digital format? And there are two ways central banks are thinking about doing that. One is to issue a token. So if you think about a dollar, a, a, a dollar bill, right? That's actually a token because the paper inherently doesn't have any value. Um, the paper on which it's printed, or maybe it does, you know, maybe it's worth something, but um, that's not the real value. The value is represented by the legal claim against the central bank. And it's like a token because it's, it is in the case of a banknote, it is a physical representation, but it is a representation of something. And that something is value, which is legal, a legal claim against the central bank. A token, which is digital, is the same, but in digital format. So that's the easy way to think about tokens. And, and, and tokens are used and tokenization and detokenization is, is a big, big area in payments, which we didn't really go into a little bit when we talked about payment cards. Um, but the concept is, just like you can take a dollar, a physical bank note, US dollar or you know a 20 shekel note um, in Israel, whatever it is, and move it from one person to another. And whoever bears the note, whoever holds that bill owns it and it has value. The same idea would apply to a token-based digital currency issued by the second central bank. One user could move it to another user and then whoever holds that token or has exclusive access to a digital wallet that holds that token, that token is what represents the value. The other way of doing it, of creating central bank digital currency is to thinking about, about an account-based approach, which would mean, okay, it's not the token that you can move to place to place, rather an account that one holds at the central bank or maybe at a, an entity that manages accounts for the central bank, and it is the account that gives the account holder the legal claim against the central bank. So these are two ways of thinking about it. Um, and then there's another aspect to the structure of CBDCs, which is, are we going to use a one-tier system or a two-tier system? So a one-tier system means that the central bank will enable card holder, uh, account holders or citizens and maybe even businesses to manage accounts at the central bank, much in the same way that commercial banks enable their customers to manage accounts at the commercial bank. So that would require the central bank to manage direct relationships, even if they're digital, with millions of users in some countries, tens of millions or even hundreds of millions of users. That is not something central banks are typically good at doing. Um, we at central banks typically work through the banking system, which then distributes the funds to the public. And so that is actually a two-tier model. So what happens today, if we think about banknotes, we do issue the currency, but it's very rare that we issue currency or provide currency to the public. There might be 0.0001% of the public that comes to the central bank to deal directly with, with currency, but that's um, not really even worth talking about. What we do is we have a secure distribution system where the banknotes go to typically a bank or sometimes to other entities and from that bank to the public. So that's a two-tier system because the public deals with the entity that deals with the central bank. So the same concept would apply to a CBDC. How? 
Well, banks could be distributors of the digital currency to the public, but they don't have to be banks. They could be fintechs. They could be other technology platforms that would need to comply with certain requirements. And it's a good question of whether the same requirements that apply to banks would need to apply to these entities that act as distributors of digital currency to the public. Because while banks have to comply with capital advocacy and liquidity um, uh, ratios imposed by banking supervision, those requirements typically apply when the same bank would like to take deposits from the public and give them out as credit, as loans. However, if the platform is really just kind of a technology platform providing distrib digital distribution and maybe also customer service, then would the same rules apply? Uh, is a good question. And then the other question is, why would such a platform even be interested in doing such a thing? So if I'm a technology company and a central bank offers me to distribute digital currency to the public, why, why would I do that? Well, let's think back to the first lecture where I talked about payments being a platform for customer engagement that gives a lot of opportunity to sell other things to customers. And those other things could be other financial products and maybe even non-financial products, goods and services. And so that might be one reason why technology companies would be interested. One could also think about a different model, which would be maybe the central bank will pay that technology platform to distribute funds on its behalf. Or maybe there could be some other type of financial model. So these are interesting questions. Um, and another interesting aspect of sovereign money is that it provides privacy or anonymity. So if you think about the physical format of fiat money, I'm not talking about the digital format that we manage at a bank or through other digital payment means, but when we think about banknotes, the user is not traced. So if I have a $100 bill and I use it to make a purchase, no one knows that I did that, except maybe the recipient. And even the recipient doesn't need to know who I am. I can go and make a payment for something somewhere and I don't have to disclose what I did. Now, in our current modern world with high levels of digitization, well, we wonder, is privacy even something that we can have anymore? But it is a concept that is central to many countries, many cultures in many countries, and it is up to the sovereign power to ensure that that privacy is protected at least at some level. There's lots of reasons why not to protect privacy. We wanna make sure, for example, that people pay tax on their income. We wanna make sure that people do not engage in illicit or illegal activity. And yet one wonders, is there not a value to privacy that needs to be protected? And is that not something that the sovereign power should provide, be it a government or a central bank? And so I can tell you in Europe, for example, this requirement of privacy is very central in the way they think about CBDCs and to some extent in the US as well. And so as central banks think about how to design central bank digital currency, there are ideas around, well, it's digital. So first of all, people might not believe that it's private, but if we're doing this as a central bank, they might actually believe us because there's a high level of trust uh, in dealing and thinking about central banks. But there are transactions that we think we should be able to track. So why don't we think about a combination? Maybe we should allow privacy protection on small transactions. So I'm gonna make this up. Up to $100. No one knows what I did. Above $100 or above $1,000 or above a million dollars. It doesn't matter. At some point, one begins to think differently about the privacy requirement. So that's an interesting aspect of how to design CBDC. And then another interesting question is, what happens if I lose my battery, my phone dies? What happens if the electricity isn't working? 
what happens if the internet connectivity is down? In that scenario, should we as a central bank prevent people from making a payment? So if we think about banknotes, physical banknotes, you don't need any of those things. You need, don't need electricity, you don't need connectivity, you don't need a battery in your phone. And if it's a central bank digital currency, what happens when I am issuing a, a fiat currency and the connectivity is down? So if I'm managing the currency from my phone, I need the battery in my phone. But, the, and let's say the store needs electricity to manage whatever mechanism we agree on, let's say it's a point of sale, like we use to pay using cards, or let's say it's even, I don't know, a QR code. But what happens if the internet connection between the point of sale or whatever device the store uses, that internet connection between the store and whatever back end we end up using, that internet connection isn't working. So today, if you think about it, if the credit card terminal is down because the telecommunication isn't working, we can still make a payment with banknotes. Should we make that possible with CBDCs? Should I be able to use my phone to make a payment in the store even if that store is disconnected from the rest of the world for whatever reason? So this question of online versus offline is actually quite a big one because it impacts the way we design the entire system and what kinds of capabilities we can make possible both online and offline. And then the third, and then the last interesting question from a design perspective is, does this need to be distributed ledger technology, DLT? So you have the answer on the screen, not necessarily. So to remind ourselves, DLT um, is the form of technology used by most digital currencies, both, both stable coins and algorithmic cryptocurrencies such as Bitcoin. And yet, so blockchain is the most well-known form of uh, DLT and there are many forms of it. Um, and yet you wonder, well, why does this need to be distributed ledger technology? It's inefficient, the capacities are limited, it consumes lots of energy, um, it is actually at the end of the day gonna be centralized. So decentralized platforms aren't really necessary. Are we only thinking about DLT because other digital currencies use DLT? Do we have any advantages by using DLT? Is it just so that we can sound like a digital currency which is not a central bank digital currency because we want to make sure that our currency continues to be relevant? And then there's different formats of DLT that we can think about. Maybe we need to use a private DLT. So it doesn't um, require as many nodes as uh, cryptocurrency that is involving tens of thousands of nodes for every transaction. So um, without going into all the details, just sharing with you some of the aspects of design relating to CBDCs that we consider when we think we as the, a central bank, when at a central bank, we think about should we use CBDCs or not? So as we think about it, we have questions certainly regarding technology. We have questions regarding what a CBDC would do to financial stability. And maybe I'll say a word about that. If today the public at large maintains balances at commercial banks and those deposits are used by the commercial bank to give credit to the public while maintaining certain levels of capital adequacy and liquidity. When we move to CBDC and enable non-banks to manage the distribution of the central bank digital currency, will that be shifting funds away from the banks and how will that impact their stability as banks and how will it impact the entire financial system's stability? Interesting questions. Um, 
at the Bank of Israel, as well as other banks, there's research going on and lots of papers that have been published. Another interesting question is, do we have the legal authority to issue digital currency? Uh, it sounds like an obvious uh, answer. You know, of course we do. We're a central bank. We can issue money. Okay, that's interesting, but read the law. When the law was written, in most countries around the world, all countries around the world, money was not digital. And it may actually say that it that the, the format of currency being issued is in a particular type of technology, be it paper, metal, or an accounts, an account at the central bank, which might not comply with or, or, or align with the requirements of CBDC. So another interesting question. And then the final topic is interoperability with cryptocurrencies. So if we have a CBDC, will it be able to act as a way to buy and sell other types of cryptocurrencies? I will remind you all from the last lecture, we talked about stable coins and we talked about that the fact that one of the main use cases, the raison d'etre for most stable coins is that they make buying and selling cryptocurrencies easier because there are so many obstacles in doing that with fiat currency from a commercial bank account. Um, so maybe CBDCs really are just a replacement for stable coins. Um, interesting questions. And kind of going backwards, I uh, dove right into what a CBDC would, what are the considerations for launching a CBDC and how it would work technically, but I didn't ask the very threshold question, which we all need to ask ourselves as central bankers, which is why do it? Why do we even need this? Lots of people don't think we need this. I, for one, am not convinced. And so there are many reasons. One, a central one is to protect the relevance of fiat currency. And remember, I started my last lecture by talking about Bitcoin, the launch of Bitcoin and the launch of what was then Libra and was renamed as DM and later was killed by Facebook, um, which were large cryptocurrency propositions that caused central banks to start asking themselves, is this currency going to compete with the currency that we issue, with fiat currency? And if so, how do we make sure that our currency continues to be relevant. One way to do that is to just make other forms of digital currency illegal. That would be quite drastic. Another way to do it is to say, okay, let's update the technology that we use. We haven't updated the technology for fiat currency for decades. Another reason to, uh, to proceed with CBDC is to offer citizens the legal right on the central bank. Remember, we talked about that's what fiat currency is in modern technological format, because again, we haven't updated our technology in a while. I think one of the most compelling cases is that it will help improve cross-border payments if CBDCs from various countries uh, are integrated with each other. I'll say that a little bit more when we talk about, I'll say a little bit more about that when we talk about cross-border payments. Another topic that comes up is redundancy. So if a payment system, um, is at risk for one reason or another, um, be it a cyber attack or lots of other reasons that we need to manage as regulators for payment systems. Is there an alternative? So I'll say that most payment systems do have alternatives. You know, if I can't pay with my credit card, I can pay by check. And if I can't pay by check, I can go withdraw money from an ATM machine. Um, and if the RTGS system isn't working, then I have a real problem. And we have some alternatives to RTGS, which are quite challenging to implement, but is CBDC the answer? It's an interesting question, but it is a reason being considered why to launch CBDCs. Another reason that has been put forth is that the transactional costs of payments can come down. And let's not forget, if the transactional cost, for example, is 1% to make a payment, 
that reduces our GDP by 1%, except for the companies that earn that transaction fee. But that is a friction, a level of friction that impacts the economy in a way that many economists would like to see go away. So is this a reason? Good question. I mean, I, I will say that if we launch CBDCs, we also need to, man to develop and launch and manage those systems as well. So someone's going to pay for it. Maybe not the payer and or the payee, but maybe the central bank will end up paying for the transactional cost. Not sure it's really going to disappear. It'll just move somewhere else. Um, and there are lots of other reasons that are put forth in literally dozens of papers being published by central banks. Um, and I will, I, I, I debated whether to put the last point on, but I, I don't think we can avoid it. And that is FOMO. Is this a case of fear of missing out? 90 central banks are working on this. Why are we not? Um, and maybe it's a fear of central banking as a community feeling that they're missing out on all the technology and innovation coming from the algorithmic cryptocurrency space and stable coins as well. Um, so there may be a psychological element going on as well. We need to pause and ask ourselves. So as I mentioned, there are 90 central banks running live projects. Most of them are still at the exploration stage. That includes Israel. There are significant projects in Sweden, Europe, the USA, the BIS, which is the Central Bank of Central Banks, the Bank of International Settlements, Canada and Singapore. I'm just calling out a few. If any of you want to kind of learn more and research more, these are some of the leading ones. Um, CBDCs have already been launched in a number of markets which are tend to be less developed. So in the Bahamas, there's a project for the Eastern Caribbean countries, so eight countries together. Jamaica and Nigeria. There are live pilots in multiple countries. The pilot in China is probably has probably generated more users than any of the other projects that I've mentioned. Um, the Chinese are not very open about what they're doing with CBDCs. Rumors have it that they have not selected one type of technology, but actually have multiple different formats and designs that they are testing in various cities. And they're actually giving money away. So if you do this, if you as a user, you agree to use their version of CBDC, you get some free money. However, even with that incentive, many of the users have been reluctant because they don't want to be tracked, taking us back to the privacy point. France, Ghana, Russia, South America, South Africa, sorry, South Korea, Ukraine, Uruguay, all have live pilots going. I don't have the latest update on Ukraine. I'm going to guess that's probably been halted since the invasion of the Ukraine by Russia. In Israel, we are um, actively exploring. I am a member of the steering committee uh, uh, leading these projects. If you look on the Bank of Israel website and on the Bank of Israel YouTube channel, you will find multiple articles that we've, multiple papers that we've published. We have multiple work streams in this space. We also did a test. We published uh, a description of, our, of the technology we used very recently, and yet it is st still in exploration stage. There are um, many theories, um, oh, sorry, going around about, um, you know, what's going to prompt some of the smaller markets to launch, to agree to, or to decide to issue a CBDC and one observation that um, is tossed around often is that when the leading developed markets do it, so will the smaller markets. So if, for example, the US or the UK or the EU um, proceed and launch, that will probably accelerate the launch of CBDCs in some of the smaller markets. Um, again, that's just a theory. There are some you know, European markets, I think Denmark, that have announced that they're not going to um, issue CBDCs in the foreseeable future. Um, and I may be misspeaking, the word choice here is very specific. Um, and yet some countries have already said, you know, we don't see a reason to do this. Um, so it is honestly, intellectually, one of the most interesting, challenging spaces in payments today. Um, if you'd like to learn more, again, as I said, there are many articles there are a number of papers that have been published on the Bank of Israel website, both in, in Hebrew and English, 
Um, but all of the banks listed here on, on the slide have published uh, papers of their own. Okay, so some reflections on um, digital currencies in general. And I'll, rem I'll remind you that we, I started the prior lecture with the question of, can digital currencies replace money? And we talked about the three um, functions that money serves. One is that it's a unit of account which denominates the price of goods and services, then it's a concrete way to express value. Two is that it's an imme a medium of exchange. It enables us to conduct financial transactions and exchange values between parties, the payer and the payee. And three, it's a store of value. It maintains the purchase power of our, of our wealth or our earnings um, over time, which requires some stability. So if we think about these three, now that we've spoken about programmatic cryptocurrencies or algorithmic cryptocurrencies, stable coins, and CBDCs, I think looking at these three parameters, three criteria or three functions, um, it's a no brainer to say that it that CBDCs will certainly serve these three functions and it, it, it will be possible to view CBDCs as money, as a replacement for money or as another type of money. Um, stable coins also, but on the condition that they really are stable. Remember in the last lecture, we talked about examples of stable coins that proved themselves to be unstable. And there have been more unfortunate events since our last lecture. So the less stable they are, the less we can rely on them as a store of value, or even in some cases, um, a medium of exchange and, and also as a unit of account. So, um, the stable coins that really are stable, as I mentioned in the prior lecture, are those that um, maintain a reserve, uh, preferably 100%, one-to-one reserve of fiat currency um, for every unit of account issued by that stable coin issuer. So those probably could function as money. Um, the others I would suggest probably not. And then the algorithmic or programmatic cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin and the thousands of others that work based on algorithms? Probably not. There are exceptions, and especially in some of the unique extreme use cases where there are no other ways to make a payment, um, the user will be more tolerant of volatility and value fluctuations and even perhaps less stability technologically. Um, but those are extreme cases. I think the days that we will see algorithmic cryptocurrencies truly competing with fiat currency are quite far off. Certainly in developed economies where we have price stability. Now you can come and say, well, we don't really have price stability. We have inflation. We have more inflation now than in recent years. Um, true. And yet still the level of volatility is not close to what we see in some of the algorithmic cryptocurrencies. So um, one last slide on cryptocurrencies. What are the opportunities and what are the concerns? We talked about um, decentralization kind of being like a democratic form of money because all the nodes need to approve every transaction and it's immutable so you can't can't fake it uh, uh or it's much much harder to perpetrate fraud where you need to convince all the different nodes that you've made a, a payment um, and so in that sense perhaps decentralization holds us more accountable it's kind of like increasing transparency um another positive aspect of let's say the technology underlying these currencies is that it enables new financial structures without intermediaries, complex, sophisticated financial transactions um, directly between the parties that are buying and selling. And so that could be an improvement to macroeconomic dynamics. Um, and something interesting that's worth thinking about is that these uh, uh, new cryptocurrencies with blockchain and distributed ledger technologies underlying them have already led sovereign powers, we talked about 90 central banks, uh, to explore new forms of innovation, to think about maybe we need to um, uh, recreate or come up with new technology that we use to issue fiat money. So in that sense, 
it's also an opportunity to, to, to trigger new innovation in the traditional uh, financial space. And you know, one question to ask about every one of these is, if, we, if central banks issue CBDCs, how would that impact every one of these types of opportunities? On the negative side, the concerns, um, there's this notion when um, using blockchain distributed ledger technology for, for cryptocurrencies, there's this notion that the code is the law because it's immutable, you cannot change it. Um, and that is viewed as a positive by the crypto community because once it's been implemented and all of the nodes have adopted it with all the smart contract features and so forth, then we can rely on it. And there won't be one centralized power that can change things retroactively. But that's all, it's also a negative because the developers are not legislators. They are not elected to power and they have not been um, uh, voted in as, uh, as decision makers who should make decisions about our financial lives. And if they wrote a code that is creating economic inefficiencies or inequalities, that's problematic, but worse, if they wrote code that deliberately manipulates the user, or even worse, deliberately defrauds the user, or mistakenly, in error, somebody makes an honest mistake, defrauds the user, and it's immutable. You can't fix it. You can't correct it. Can we rely on it? And if the scale gets big enough, might that mistake or deliberate hack impact macroeconomic financial stability? It's an interesting question, especially when we think about the fact that these coders, these developers are not regulated. Who watches over them? You know, when a bank launches a new IT system, there is a supervisor of banks overseeing and regulating. And when a central bank launches a technology system, like we do, we have lots of checks and balances. But when it's a, an unknown entity or an entity that is no supervision, can we rely on it? And should we allow it if it's going to impact financial stability? Good question. Another interesting question about cryptocurrencies is this crazy concept that they actually run counter opposite to what you expect in a free economy. What do I mean by that? So when you buy or sell Bitcoin or, or another type of algorithmic cryptocurrency, typically you pay a transaction fee to the, to the miners. And that transaction fee goes up when the vol volume of trading goes up. So the more volume, the higher the fees. Why? Because these are uh, incentives for the miners to keep working. That's exactly the opposite of one, what one would expect. Because normally when volumes go up, simple supply and demand, uh, theories of economics, you learn first week in economics 101, when volumes go up, prices go down. And so, um, especially when it comes to using um, money to make transactions. So this is a conundrum. Um, another big piece that we all uh, know about is that cryptocurrencies, both stable coins and um, algorithmic cryptocurrencies do tend to enable money laundering and terror financing because the tracking, the identification, the KYC, the know your customer requirements that apply to traditional financial systems are not enforced well on the blockchain. That's changing. 
And yet it's, we have quite a long road to haul and there is evidence um, in Israel that there is terror financing on the blockchain and that there is money laundering going on. And it's not just in Israel. I just happen to live here, but you know, globally, this is a concern among regulators. And we talked about the FATF travel rule to try to address this concern. Another concern is um, how tax works. Ta uh, you know, is is are, are cryptocurrencies being used for tax evasion? There is evidence that the answer is yes, and there is also evidence that users of crypto who want to pay tax on their profits also encounter obstacles, compliance obstacles from the banking system in certain countries, in most countries. So. Um, that is almost like an incentive to prevent them to evade tax payments. And then the last one is the impact on the monetary system, which if we think about um, the fact that it's still kind of like a fringe uh, type of investment, then the impact is limited. But we saw and we understand that there are more and more mainstream financial institutions looking to enable transactions in crypto, many of them already do, and, the, and, and, and many looking to invest um, institutional funds in crypto and to enable investors to invest their funds in crypto. Um, and we're talking about traditional regulated financial institutions. So the more it becomes mainstream, the more volumes grow, the greater the risk that there could be an impact on the monetary system and the central bank's ability to impact and manage uh, its, its a monetary policy. Um, and then the question again is become, can CBDCs address these concerns? So I think to the extent that CBDCs can replace cryptocurrencies, the answer is yes, but that's a good question. Will they replace it? Or maybe the right approach is to just regulate these types of currencies. Okay, I need to go faster. Cross-border payments. I'll give you an overview, talk about use cases, take you through correspondent banking, cross-border instant payments, talk about what the cards and card schemes are doing, blockchain for cross-border. And then I always try to give you names of specific companies. So uh, we'll, I'll take you through some of the traditional players, fintechs, and quick slide on international sanctions as they relate to cross-border payments. So what are the challenges in, in cross-border payments? Um, foreign currency exchange. So when I am a payer in a particular country and I pay another payee in that same country, I don't even think about the currency. That's, it's easy. It stays the same currency. But the minute I'm paying someone in another jurisdiction, which has a different currency, that introduces a, a new challenge. So the EU uh, solved that for most of their member states. They're all using the Euro now. If we think back to when that happened, that was quite dramatic. All the countries in the EU had to agree to surrender their own currency. Um, so at least they solved it there, but uh, most corridors in the world do have the foreign currency challenge. Another issue is that um, anti-money laundering and counter-terrorist financing rules are not consistent across jurisdictions. So if my financial institution identified me as um, complying with the KYC requirements and the AML and, and counter-terror financing requirements, and I want to make a payment to a payee in another country, and the rules that apply in that country are different from the rules that apply to my country, that creates a problem because that might mean that it will add friction to the transaction flow before the payee gets their funds. And in some cases, the payee might not even get their funds. Big challenge. Another issue is that we have different payment systems in different countries. So that is also domestic. So even in one country, sometimes we have multiple payment systems that need to somehow interact. When it's different countries, it makes it even more complicated. How do you uh, transfer value between countries? And then another smaller issue is the unharmonized settlement windows. So we talked about um, in some of the prior lectures about how money in settlement systems settles in batches in at a particular time of the day. And because those windows are not harmonized, sometimes that adds more time until the funds are settled. Um, 
So to, to, to solve, address these, some of these problems. So even though we have all these problems, we do have very big volumes in cross-border payments. Um, interesting to understand that in cross-border payments, what's moving between countries is the data and not the money. So it may be that a bank holds money at another bank in another country, and then they ask that bank in the other country, the originating bank, asks the recipient bank to credit someone, but it's the, that request is what's moving and not necessarily the money. Um, and so it creates a scenario where the entities involved in cross-border payments need to open accounts in multiple jurisdictions. Um, in order to make a cross-border payment, we need an FX, a foreign currency, exchange provider um, in order to um, provide the foreign currency um, to, to solve the current foreign currency challenge. And then typically that entity takes a fee, which makes these transactions more expensive. Um, this should say identity database providers, um, which relates to the KYC requirements. And then there's lots of fraud processes because there does tend to be more fraud in cross-border payments. So if we look at uh, this, this guy um, who's the head of the Financial Stability Board, a letter that he wrote to the G20 um, um, in February, just read it quickly, the use. So at speaking on behalf of this um, global, really, Financial Stability Board, in, in, in a letter to the G20, he writes, the use of new technology is one important element of the ongoing work to enhance cross-border payments. So this is a target of both bodies. The aim of this initiative is to bring about cheaper, faster, and more transparent and inclusive cross-border payment services, including remittances. I'll talk about that in a minute. For the benefit of citizens and businesses worldwide, after and they wrote, he wrote this in February, after a following a year of foundational work under the G20 roadmap for enhancing cross-border payments and the establishment of quantitative targets, the next stage of work includes the development of specific proposals for material improvements to existing systems and arrangements, as well as the development of new systems. The practical work involved will require global coordination, strong involvement from the public and private sectors, and sustained political support. It will also require investment in order, to, in order to upgrade systems, processes, and technologies. I put this on here and read it to you because I, I want everyone to understand there are quite significant multi-country initiatives on improving cross-border payments. So the G20 roadmap um, is significant because the G20 is a group of 20 countries that represent 60% of the world population, 80% of global GDP, and 75% of global exports. The targets that the G20 set in terms of retail payments is that the cost will be not more than 1% of the transaction by 2028 um, on average, and that no single corridor will cost more than 3% of the transaction, where it might much higher percentages now. And there is an acknowledgement that remittances, which are people sending money home, generally migrant workers, um, are tend to be more expensive because they tend to be more challenging, less developed markets. And so the, the target that they established there is that when a worker wants to send $200 home by the year 2030, it'll cost more, but still they want an average cost of not more than 3% and no single card or more than 5%. So just to give you a sense, all these countries together are looking at very quantitative targets with dates. They want by tw moving on to speed by 2028, 75% of cross-border payments performed in an hour. Normally it takes a few days. Today it takes a few days. And the rest, the other 25% within one business day, these are very challenging targets. 2028 is not long from now. Access in retail payments, they want all end users to have access to electronic cross-border payments. Um, and remittances, 90% of individuals who want to send money home should be able to do so. And they also want, in, on the transparency side, by 2028, all per payment service providers to disclose the total cost of cross-border payments, the time for payment, to provide tracking and terms of service to every user. And these are things that are not currently available. I'll let you in on a secret, which isn't a secret. It's a well-known secret. And that is that the financial space 
makes a lot of money and has lots of hidden fees in cross-border more than most other spaces. Um, so the roadmap just, um, uh, we're, we're kind of like in the second phase now for the G20. They're looking for public-private partnerships, uh, regulatory supervisory and oversight uh, frameworks, updating existing payment infrastructures, as I mentioned earlier, looking to improve data and market practices, and possibly to also build new payment infrastructures, maybe in the form of CBDCs. This is just to show you there's like literally a Gantt chart with the G20 coming together and coming up with specific projects um, on how they need to proceed. This is what they did in 2021, and this shows what they'll do in 2022. I'm not going to um, go into the details if you want to look it up, but I think what we need to take away from it is that there is a significant global effort now to improve cross-border payments. So what are the use cases? Let's start with wholesale payments. We talked about the difference between wholesale and retail. Wholesale payments is when two financial institutions send each other money, when one sends money to the other. So that necessarily, that will not necessarily impact the user um, or the business who are their customers, but financial institutions do send each other funds. Another use case that I mentioned earlier is the remittances where normally a worker Normally, a migrant worker sends money home to another country. Uh, we live in Israel. The most common anecdotal story is uh, Filipino workers who live locally and send money home every month, or perhaps Thai workers uh, who are here working in agriculture and they uh, send money home every month. Those are examples of remittances. Um, those are typically person-to-person -person payments. They're sending money to their family, but there are other types of person-to-person -person payments that are also cross-border my sister often complains that she has a hard time sending gifts to my children uh, because there is not a good platform for her to do so. I think that's improving now, um, but that's an example of a person-to-person -person payment, which is not a remittance. International travel, I may, so we're going on a family vacation abroad and we purchased uh, flight tickets from a foreign uh, airline carrier. That's an example of a cross-border payment a huge one, very big, is in business to business for imports and exports. Look down here at the bottom, 80% of cross-border payments are business to business related. And 95% of that is dominated by banks. Um, and then the last big one that we all know as consumers is international e-commerce. That has become much more common in recent years, especially as a result of COVID. So people um, who are going online anyway to make a purchase, why not look for the cheapest price and maybe buy it from a foreign vendor? And normally when that's done, the payment is made by card, at least in the more developed countries. So correspondent banking is a world of its own. Um, just to think about the transaction flow, um, a let's say a company or a person, doesn't matter, through its bank initiates a payment. That money goes to a correspondent bank. So bank. So if, if I'm the company and I have a bank account and I want to send it to another company in another country, it's not that my bank is necessarily sending the money directly to the recipient's bank. That almost never happens. What, happen, what does happen is that my bank sends the money or sends at least data requesting movement of money to a correspondent bank, that correspondent where, 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 where my bank maintains an account, okay? That correspondent bank sends the data to another correspondent bank in the destination country. That correspondent bank moves the money to the beneficiary bank, which then moves the money to the beneficiary. This typically takes several days. Every one of the elements in the chain are probably taking a fee, not probably, but definitely, either as a flat fee or as a percentage of the foreign currency conversion or both. But interesting to note, though, is that this, this bank has to manage a foreign currency account at this correspondent bank, and this bank has to manage a foreign currency account at this current correspondent bank, and the money moves between them. 
what's so so the data moves and then the funds that are managed in the correspondent bank accounts are where the settlement takes place interesting to note that there are aml anti-money laundering risks um borne by the correspondent banks to such a significant extent and enforcement has grown to such a significant extent which manifests itself in sometimes significant fines in the billions of dollars being imposed by regulators on the banks. So this is such a big problem that the number of correspondent banks worldwide is decreasing. So that creates a problem because it makes it a more competitive space, which will only increase the cost of cross-border uh, uh, payments through correspondent banking. And the vast majority of cross-border payments are done through correspondent banking. But perhaps it's also creating an opportunity for new market entrants. Now, all the correspondent banking, almost all, not all, almost all, way north of 90% takes place on the SWIFT platform. And I'll say a little bit about SWIFT when we talk about the companies active in this space. So that's like, we could just stop there. Cross-border payments on using correspondent banking with SWIFT is really the vast, vast majority of volumes. However, there are other initiatives. So there is an initiative, there is a concept, not an initiative, there are many initiatives um, wh which would enable instant payments cross-border. You'll remember that we talked about instant payments. By the way, it's not a coincidence that I left cross-border and B2B for the end because this brings it all together. I'll be mentioning a lot of the things that I talked about in prior lectures. So you'll remember we talked about uh, a concept of moving money from one account to another in a matter of seconds using a platform that can be caused fast, called faster payments. Some countries call it instant payments. Some countries call it immediate payments. And some countries call it real-time payments. But the idea is that these immediate payment platforms will connect with each other. So there are multiple projects across the world. The one that's already live is called TIPS. Um, you'll note that there is a platform across Europe called uh, Target, which enables um, wire transfers uh, between markets that are members of the EU. And they launched a platform on top of Target called TIPS, which stands for Target Instant Payment Settlement, which enables, and, and it's managed, it was launched and is managed by the Euro system, um, and it settles only in euros. So it enables Euro area countries to send cross-border payments in euros as an instant payment in a matter of seconds. Not all the financial institutions are using this, but I want you to be aware of it. SWIFT, which manages all the correspondent banking, also launched SWIFT GPI, which enables cross-border instant payments on the SWIFT network. And all banks participating in SWIFT can use this. They do not all use this. Um, and that will uh, migrate cross-border correspondent banking to instant payments. It's a long road, but the platform exists. So it's not, you know, we're still early days. Um, IXB is uh, an initiative that would connect faster or immediate payments in the US with SWIFT in Europe. Um, and there are seven banks that have completed a POC with this. And Nexus is a project by the BIS, remember the Central Bank of Central Banks called the Bank of International Settlements, um, did a project with the Singapore Monetary Authority, which created a blueprint to connect multiple instant payment platforms across the world. And they're testing, I think they completed testing uh, Singapore, Malaysia, and the Euro area, and there are many others. This is just a sample. Cards and card schemes. So we know that you can use a card, a, a payment card we talked about. Interoperability, which is one of the main promises that the global card brands provide. So if I have a Visa card or a MasterCard in country A, one of the interoperability, one of the promises that these brands give me as a user is that I'll be able to make a payment anywhere in the world that accepts Visa or MasterCard. And the other way around, if I have a business that accepts a payment by Visa or MasterCard, I have a promise from those brands that anyone in the world that has a Visa or MasterCard will, enable to, will be able to make a payment to me. That is much easier said than done. These are vast networks with lots of investment, both in technology and processes and risk management. Um, that is alive and kicking, and it's probably the single largest source of revenue for both Visa and MasterCard. Um, and yet there are others. 
the uh, there are other types of cross-border initiatives which are much 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 smaller let's not even come close to comparing them but so you'll be aware of them visa launched something called b2b connect which is a blockchain based platform to enable uh, banks to send money each other to each other cross border i think the minimum there is ten thousand dollars i think it's a not as big a project as as was envisioned when it launched um visa direct and mastercard money send are products that um, enable um, uh, push payments from one card holder to another on cards, on payment cards. And that's not only domestic, but also cross-border very early days. Blockchain. So yes, people are using blockchain to make cross-border payments. Um, you'll see here an article that talked about when um, Russia invaded Ukraine, more people started using Bitcoin to make payments to each other because the banking systems in both countries were impacted. Um, I'll go to the right here. Ripple is a, a platform. Um, so their native cryptocurrency is called XRP. So you can you can make a cross-border payment with XRP and really with most uh, uh, algorithmic uh, cryptocurrencies and many of the stable coins. Um, um, but what's more interesting is you'll see below the graph here is something called RippleNet, which was designed and built for banks. And many banks have already connected to RippleNet, which enables cross-border payments um, uh, uh, worldwide. And then also um, there are projects where uh, CBDC, so central banks, are looking to connect their CBDC platforms should they launch. Um, there are, and so this is coordinated uh, usually by the BIS, and you'll note that in recent weeks, just a couple of weeks ago here in Israel, we also launched some, uh, we announced projects, uh, we announced I think one project uh, where we will be um, cooperating with other jurisdictions to, innate, to test uh, cross-border payments on CBDC, and there are multiple projects like this coordinated by the BIS. You can go on their website and learn more. We don't have time to go into all of it. So just to mention some of the main players, SWIFT, as I said, is a, it's really a platform. The, um, the banks worldwide, they have about 10,000 banks that, that use it, that enables cross-border payments and also enables domestic payments between banks. But it's um, a platform that generally moves data in a secure fashion. And then the settlement happens on another platform. Um, Swift is a uh, it, it's a co-op, believe it or not. Visa and Mastercard also started as co-ops, by the way, as did many of the payment systems, um, owned by um, all the banks that operate in, in Swift. Um, and then there are committees or or uh, governing bodies that manage Swift. But the members of those committees are actually um, selected, elected, appointed by the banks that are members of SWIFT. Um, moving on, Western Union and MoneyGram enable money transfers uh, worldwide. They have branches everywhere. So you can go in and literally give $500 in cash to a Western Union branch, and they will credit the Western Union bank account in the destination country. And then the branch of Western Union um, will make the funds available to the recipient, similar with MoneyGram. CLS is um, a global platform with 18 currencies um, enabling um, foreign currency uh, conversion, but really designed to reduce foreign currency settlement risk. They are active in the uh, shekel, um, so a world of its own. I uh, don't have time to go into it. It's not a a brand known by consumers, but certainly in the banking industry, it is central to much of the foreign currency transactions in those 18 leading currencies. Um, and then all the card brands that you see on the right also enable cross-border payments, mainly using e-commerce. So I mentioned that there are opportunities for new market entrants. Perhaps the better known ones are Wise and Revolut. Um, but Wise, Remitly, and Revolut are all, I believe, uh, British companies which have also listed um, on the exchange in the UK. Wise did a direct listing and received quite handsome valuations. They have come down in recent years, but what's in, in uh, recent weeks. 
But what's interesting um, with, with their models is what they, at least wise, and I think also remitly, certainly wise, they open accounts in multiple countries. And then when you have an account, it used to be known as TransferWise, by the way. So they rebranded when they went public. Uh, may, many of you may know them as TransferWise, uh, if they changed their name. And so if I download their app and load money onto it um, and make a payment to someone in another country, um, typically what they do is they'll maintain an account either at a commercial bank or at the central bank um, in, in the originating country. And they will also maintain an account in the destination country and they won't necessarily move funds cross border. They'll just credit their own account in country A and then debit their account in country B and move the money um, to, the, to the recipient. Um, by the way, this is only a partial list. Even as I speak, I'm thinking of more country, more companies that perhaps I, I could have uh, listed here. Um, it is a world of its own um, and lots of opportunity there. Maybe I'll also mention Payoneer which I mentioned in my first lecture also, it's one of the more successful Israeli fintechs. <clears throat> um, they, they hold themselves out as, out as being uh, American. They are um, registered in the US, but they really are a global company uh, with a, a global company with um, payment services, uh, payment service provider licenses, um, really in, in, in I think dozens of countries, but they focus on cross-border payments for um, businesses and they specialize in massive payouts so if you think about, for example, Amazon, which has many sellers um, who need to they collect money from the buyers and then at some point need to make massive payouts to all the sellers who are selling on their platform. So that's that's an example of kind of place where Payoneer specializes. They also enable, um, let's say, freelancers in country A, call it Pakistan, to open a bank account in country B, call it uh, the U.S., and, and receive funds into that bank account from their US customers. As an example, Revolut is a neo bank, which is, has a full banking license in some jurisdictions. Actually, I don't know if that's true. I know that the UK full banking license still hasn't come. Um, and yet they provide banking services across the world, also known as a challenger bank. I mentioned these types of entities. But what's interesting to notice about Revolut is the way they started was by providing very low cost foreign currency cross-border payments. Um, a note about international sanctions. So when Russia invaded the Ukraine, this is the most recent event uh, that triggered uh, sanctions on SWIFT. One of the first things that the United States initiated was sanctions on Russia um, using SWIFT. So what's perhaps well known is that this happened, but it's perhaps less known that while this is a very strong type of mechanism, it is still quite limited. So SWIFT as an entity, first of all, can't just disconnect a country. They have governance. Their governing bodies are elected by member banks from across the world. And when they make such a decision, um, it has wide ranging impact to the point that they can't really just disconnect a country. And what happened in the case of Russia, um, they only dis only, I mean, they disconnected seven banks in Russia. They didn't disconnect all of the banks in Russia. They disconnected the state banks. And um, the others were able to continue operating in SWIFT. And this was um, quite delicate because Russia also sell sells energy to lots of countries, including to countries in Europe. And those countries needed to continue, they still need to continue buying energy from Russia. And Russia is not going to sell energy to anyone without getting paid. So if, for example, Germany needs to make a payment for energy to Russia, and Russia has been disconnected from SWIFT, how is Germany going to make that payment? So this is very delicate. And then another aspect of the sanctions is that disconnecting banks is one aspect. But another aspect is we could come up with a sanctions list that says the following 200 individuals may not receive payments from anyone. They're on a blacklist. Can that be enforced through SWIFT? Not really. 
because SWIFT would disconnect a bank. They can't disconnect a specific individual. And so then there are entities that manage the blacklists of the sanctioned individuals. Um, and so uh, these are all quite complicated um, scenarios. And then the last thing that I would mention is that um, in, I forget the year, but when a number of years ago, not that long ago, when Russia invaded Crimea and the um, uh, West wanted to impose sanctions, Russia understood that this is a problem and started developing its own alternative to SWIFT. And China did the same thing. So now they have members of their own money transfer platforms and they can move money that way. Now, these alternative systems are not quite as good, secure, and efficient as SWIFT, and yet there are other ways for them to move money amongst themselves, uh, you know, with some of the other countries that participate, and there are even members of these alternative systems in Europe. And so SWIFT no longer dominates 100% of the cross-border transactions. Um, and we also have money moving on the blockchain, as I mentioned earlier. So, uh, you know, through crypto. So that severely impacts uh, the effectiveness of sanctions on SWIFT. And then um, the last thing I wanted to mention in this context is that when something like this happens and the West or the SWIFT or a combination of countries decide to disconnect a banking system, this happened with Iran a number of years ago, by the way. And here uh, we also see on the left that in 2018, Trump um, also uh, uh, sought to sanction Iran because of the political developments with the, uh, the treaty uh, with Iran in 2018. When these things happen, countries in, you know, worldwide ask themselves, so are we at risk? Do we need our own alternative system? Um, and as a, a reaction to these sanctions, some countries actually begin developing their own alternative systems. And so it's a double-edged sword. If these sanctions are imposed too vigorously, it may actually create a scenario where next time it'll be even harder to impose sanctions using SWIFT. So this is all a lecture of its own. Wow, we're running short on time. Business-to-business -business payments. So in the business-to-business -business environment, there is still so much more paper than one would expect when we understand the high level of digitization in most aspects of the economy, the processes still tend to be extremely inefficient and it is a place that is ripe, <clears throat> ripe for digital disruption. Before I dive in, I wanna say a few words. When I say B2B, what do I mean? So let's think about the three types of entities um, that make and receive payments. So people, person, that's a P. Businesses, that's a B. And governments, that's a G. And you'll see that every one of these is a scenario. So person-to-person -person payments or P2P. Person-to-business or business-to-person, P2B and B2B. So why would we talk about business-to-person payments? You know what? Sometimes a customer is entitled to a refund. Sometimes an insurance company needs to pay out an insurance claim. We all know about person to business. That's the most common. That's when we pay uh, a business for goods or services, when we buy something at the store or pay a lawyer. Um, businesses are also making payments to governments, B to G, taxes generally, but not only. Sometimes governance, governments make payments to businesses. Think about the um, incentive programs during the COVID era when governments paid money out to businesses to keep them from becoming insolvent. And then P2G, business people paying government, again, generally taxes, but not only, you know, it might be uh, paying for a government service, such as maybe education, or um, uh, say in some cases uh, for, for utilities, like gas or electricity, which are sometimes government owned entities. And G2P is where governments pay people. So again, the COVID period is, is the most uh, uh, recent one that we can think about where governments made lots of payments out to people, but sometimes they pay tax refunds and so on. And then each of these pay themselves. Businesses or governments pay other governments. Uh, it could be a municipal government paying a federal government. 
Um, and businesses also pay each other. And that's B2B. So just to kind of, and that's all just in the retail environment. And we also have wholesale payments where financial institutions pay each other. So just wanted to map that out for you. We're not going to talk about all of them. We already spoke about many of them. But when we talk about B2B, I'm talking about a very, very narrow segment. It's just when businesses pay other businesses. And so conceptually, when we say they're complex, why is that? Why is business to business particularly complex? Well, because many businesses have multiple suppliers. I saw a study that on average, um, the large uh, businesses, and they're not that large, I think it's beginning with 100 employees, are making a, payments to 1,000 suppliers or more a month. Sounds high to me, but even if it's 100, it's very different from a person and the number of suppliers he or she pays. They typically have complex procurement and purchasing processes. They're often in multiple locations, both receiving and making payments, often in more than one country. The payment methods are not synchronized. So the date on which uh, settlement takes place by check or by cards or by wire transfers is different. Um, typically they have large order quantities. So what I mean by that is if you get an invoice, you might have 200 lines of the number or a thousand lines, each one describing a different item that was purchased. Typically individuals have much shorter um, lists, except maybe when you purchase at the supermarket, but even then businesses have much larger order quantities. And often there are specific contract terms, payment terms. So pay net 30, net 90, pay under only under certain conditions and so on. And so when we think about a B2B transaction, if it's a company making the payment, entities in that or, or divisions involved from that corporation include the legal department, procurement, accounts payable, accounts receivable, treasury and compliance. Um, you know, Sarbox, Sarbanes-Oxley have all kinds of requirements about even how you manage the procurement process to make sure there isn't any uh, funny stuff, monkey business, also known as corruption and fraud going on. And the documents are, are, um, are, are many. So you start with an offer or a proposal by the vendor you, that becomes a purchase order by the, the, the company receiving or, or purchasing the service or product, then there is an invoice issued by the vendor, it often comes with a delivery slip, only then the payment is made, then the receivers, uh, the, the, then there's a receipt that's issued, and then after that, reconciliation, you know, did we actually pay what we were supposed to pay based on all the prior documents? So quite complex. Um, payment methods include things like employee reimbursement, think about that, uh, um, an employee buys office equipment using her personal funds. This happens. Think about private schools. The teachers, this happens in public schools too. I'm avoiding public schools because that gets us into the government sector. But even think about public schools. Teachers actually are given a budget because it's so hard to manage when they have to go out and buy things to decorate their classroom. And then they need to get reimbursed, not to mention employees who travel for uh, corporate travel and often have to pay out of pocket, and then they submit money for reimbursement. That is also business to business. Payment by ACH, payment by commercial cards, so credit cards issued to the company, um, payment by check, payment by instant payments, payment by RTGS transfers. So multiple payment methods used all by the same business. And when the company tries to decide how to pay, they think about the speed of payment, the cost of payment, whether it's secure, how much data is available about the payment in order both to manage and control the payment processes, as well as report um, for purposes of budget management. The extent of integration by all of these payment methods with the various ERP platforms that are used by the relevant corporation. And they also ask themselves, if I pay by a particular payment method, will it be accepted by the supplier, because remember it's B2B. So there are suppliers who refuse to accept checks and there are suppliers who refuse to accept credit cards. When was the last time that a corporate client was able to pay their legal bill or their accounting bill to the accounting firm using a credit card? So lots of considerations in B2B payments. And we also need to think about the fact that certainly with respect to small businesses, sometimes the payments platform is used as a basis for lending. So 
let's take Israel as an example when we talk about checks. In Israel, we have 812 billion shekels a year in check volumes last year, which is huge. But many of the customers are paying by post-dated checks. So let's say they pay uh, net 90 or whatever, a post-dated check that will be will come due 90 days from now. And so the recipient received the payment, but they can't, um, and, and they provided the good or service, but they can't, uh, it affects their cash flow. They, they, didn't, they didn't receive the funds the same day. And so what they do is they will sell that check to a discounting company um, for let's say 90% of the price of the check. And so that discounting company um, will often resell the check to another discounting company. So to give you some proportion, in a country of 9 million people, our um, card volumes, uh, you know, credit cards, debit cards, PP cards, mostly credit cards in Israel, um, are about 380 billion shekels a year. Check values are 818 billion shekels a year. Most of that is business to business. And 100 billion out of 800 billion goes through factoring. So it's actually a credit proposition. Invoice factoring, um, huge segment in the United States providing um, uh, credit to small businesses. Vendor financing using some of the documents described earlier. Merchant cash advance is another space where um, uh, entity, financial entities, usually non-banks, look at the receivables of a business um, and use those receivables as a, they buy the receivables and provide cash advance to the merchant in order to enable them to finance their uh, cash flow. So lots of FinTech players in this space. I took the slide from uh, FT Partners, which is a, um, a VC that invests in FinTechs in this space. Um, and you'll see that many of them are Israeli. So just quickly looking, Bluevine is Israeli, Tipalti is Israeli. Um, there were a few others here that I, um, I'm not catching right now, Melio um, and some others. So a few words, we're, we're, we're almost at the end about payment regulation. Um, so yes, we do regulate payments. I regulate, my, my team in the, the Bank of Israel regulate payment systems, and then there are regulators. So we, we regulate, it's kind of like the transportation system between um, uh, payment service providers. So when one entity, call it a bank, uh, moves money to another entity, call it another bank, or call it a, a, a card acquirer, or whatever it is, call it a fintech. The movement of money between the financial messages and settlement of funds between financial entities is what we regulate as payment system regulators, because those things are payment systems. But then every entity acting in the payment system is also regulated by its own regulator. So perhaps there's a credit union regulated by the entity that regulates, by the regulator, regulator that regulates credit unions. And perhaps there's a supervisor of banks that regulates the banks. And perhaps there's another regulator that regulates uh, the fintechs and so on. So if we look at the collective set of rules and regulations, what are the threats that regulation um, imposes? So first of all, non-compliance. And the biggest one that everyone always talks about is uh, anti-money laundering and counter-terrorist uh, uh, financing. Um, there are also financial stability requirements, cybersecurity requirements, governance requirements. So when a uh, payment system or a payment service provider um, doesn't comply with one of these requirements, they could be fined. They could even be requested to terminate business. Um, that's a threat to their ongoing business activities. Um, there are also competition laws that often apply, especially in payments, because in payments, competitors must work together. They send each other financial messages, they settle funds amongst themselves, and they pay each other transaction fees. So that is an invitation to the antitrust or competition regulator to have a look and make sure there's a level playing field. But there was also the reverse, which is sometimes the competition regulator decides not to, inter to intervene. And you, there's usually a high threshold for intervention. And so here I actually wrote the reverse. There is a threat of lack of enforcement of competition laws where the new market entrants, the little guys are already disadvantaged because they have fewer customers and fewer and less funds. And now if the competition regulator doesn't ensure a level playing field, it's even harder for them to operate. And then another 
issue that I put up here on the screen as a threat coming from regulation is misunderstood pay, uh, business models because in the payment space, it's very difficult and very rare to find a regulator that really understands how payments works. And that's one of the reasons that um, my department and I personally spend a lot of time educating the industry as well as other regulators about how payments work. So opportunities, I love this one. I often say that regulation is also an opportunity. We are human beings, the regulators are human beings, and we have targets too, and we like to achieve them. And it is an opportunity for entrepreneurs and business people to engage regulators to try to understand what is it that we are trying to achieve and how can that become a business opportunity? How can we work together? So one broad goal that you see worldwide since the uh, global financial crisis in 2008 really is that new market entrants are very much desired by regulators in the payment space because as I, we mentioned earlier, payments are often a platform for other financial services. So regulators are looking to welcome new market participants. How can entrepreneurs help us make that happen, happen and, and entrepreneurs and business people? There's another business opportunity, I think, in standardization, what I'm calling standardization of standards. So if you look at open banking, which regulators often use to require banks to open their legacy systems and make them accessible to non-bank uh, third parties, one aspect of that is payment initiation. So as a consumer, I will enable a third party. I will give them permission to access my bank account and initiate a payment to another recipient. Um, and there are standards around how that should work. ISO 222 is another global standard for how financial messaging will look. Um, that's led by SWIFT, but it's also required by regulation. We have required it in some contexts. Strong customer authentication is a space where the EU has been very active and we are also becoming more active and that's happening worldwide. Um, and each of these is a case of, well, we have a standard, but the standards by design are also flexible enough for some fields to be flexible and defined or redefined by particular markets or even by particular players. And then when a third party comes in and says, well, I'd like to connect to your bank using payment and, and provide payment initiation, well, if that bank provided open banking in a different way than another bank, is that an opportunity? Well, yes, there are aggregators of open banking, for example, across the world that have um, that make it easier to connect. ISO 222, there are specialists in this field globally, strong customer authentication. How can I comply as a payment service provider with SCA requirements? So there are business opportunities to help um, make these various formats of supposed standards, more standard. Um, and then they also need to be tested. And the automation of the testing is also an opportunity because testing manually is uh, almost impossible in some cases. Another aspect, uh, which is a business opportunity, I think is sales tax and value added tax um, because um, the, the, the global trend is to say, okay, so cross-border has grown and you know, global platforms and big tech companies enable a buyer in one country to buy from a seller in another country more easily. But hey, we're losing tax revenue opportunities because if it's a domestic transaction in the United States, sales tax applies and in other countries, value added tax applies. Why doesn't it apply to cross-border transactions? And so there are more and more rules and regulations imposing uh, these local taxes on multinational and cross-border transactions. And so how do you comply? So one way to comply is you actually need a local entity. So that is actually an opportunity. Uh, somebody can come to a, a, an Amazon or a Google even, or a Facebook and say, I'll help you. <clears throat> In my market, you can use my legal entity and I'll do all the reporting and the compliance for you. Lots of questions around how to comply with AML requirements and KYC requirements to enforce the FATF travel rule. And we, we see many companies in this space um, providing solutions. And also instant payments is a, is a space uh, where most regulators, including in Israel, are looking to grow volumes. It's viewed as a, as a platform for innovation, which is also an opportunity to reduce transaction costs. So any opportunity to increase volumes will help um, achieve these regulatory targets. So thank you for your time and attention. I really appreciate your staying with me all this time. There is pay tech everywhere. I really mean that. Everywhere I look, 
I see propositions and you are invited to think about all of these things from that perspective. For those who'd like to stay on for another few minutes, um, I'm happy to do so to answer questions or to hear some comments. Um, and this will all uh, be uh, live as a recorded video, both on the Bank of Israel website, uh, YouTube channel, as well as the Gershon Fintech Center website for those who want to come back and listen again. Um, and if you'd like to engage directly, uh, my email address is listed on the Bank of Israel website. So uh, just look under management. Uh, be glad to hear from you. We do make an ongoing effort to stay in touch with the fintech community. And I will also say what I meant to mention earlier, um, and that is that we had a wonderful, I can't remember if I mentioned this or not. I think I did. We had a wonderful um, payments conference by the Bank of Israel a few weeks ago. And all those sessions are now live, including my presentation there. Um, so if you'd like to learn more about what the Bank of Israel is doing with central bank digital currencies or with any of the uh, payment methods that I mentioned, uh, there were lots of um, uh, very interesting sessions uh, at that conference that are now live on the Bank of Israel YouTube channel as well. So thank you all. Very uh, nice to have you. And if you'd like to ask a question or two, I, I'll stay on for a few minutes. Or we could call it a day. Let's give a minute. Usually. Yeah, thank you very <laughs> much. It was an excellent course. Thank you for tuning in from another, from, from a, not another, from a professor, right? Yeah. I hope you, there, are, uh, there will be much more students interested in this area that will be happy to join this area and uh, to work in this field. Yeah, look, I think it's a fascinating space. It's one of the few spaces where you really see cutting edge technology intersecting with financial uh, services. We have another professor here, right? <laughs> Hello. Hi, Danny. I think I know you as Yaron Galai's father. Is that accurate? <laughs> I'm going to tell you something. I met him right like the week he launched his... Uh, his, his company in New York. We were on a panel together. They were interviewing Israeli entrepreneurs living in New York. I had a startup at the time. Mine didn't go quite as well as his, but uh, we were on the same panel. The mute, Danny. I think he was saying goodbye. Or, or, yeah, no, no. Uh, I'm glad to hear that you met your own. It must yeah, have maybe, been you might not remember me. It was back, I think, in 2008, something like that. But uh, yeah. yeah, seven, seven. Okay. Okay. So if we have no more questions, um, thank you very much for attending. I hope you uh, learned a thing or two, and um, let's say I, I hope you learned as much as I did because I did uh, uh, learn a lot by putting these together. And uh, we look forward to continuing to engage. Have a good evening. Thank, thank you very you. much, Ben. And thank you, Afira, for the opportunity. Afira and David, who's not with us. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.